Well, praise the Lord, everybody. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Wouldn't you agree? This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad. If you don't mind, let's stand together and let's sing. Sing an old song of the church. We're going to hold to God's unchanging hand. Time is filled with swift transition. Not on earth on move can stand. Oh, build your own things eternal. Oh, you hold to God's unchanging hand. Oh, you ought to hold to his hand. God's unchanging hand, oh, to his hand, God's unchanging hand, oh, build your own things eternal, oh, to God's unchanging hand, verse 2. Oh, trust in him who will not leave you. Oh, whatsoever years may bring. If thy earthly friends forsaken. Still more closely to him cling. Oh, to his hand. Let's sing it together. And God's unchanging hand. Oh, to his hand. God's unchanging hand. Oh, be. Your hopes on things eternal. Oh, to God's unchanging hand. Let's say that one more time. Oh, to his hand. God's unchanging hand. Oh, to his hand. God's unchanging hand. Strong things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Put your hands together if you love the Lord. Hallelujah. Pastor said two, so we're going to do two. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. We remain standing and we believe tonight that God is real. He is true to his word and all of his promises according to scripture are yes and amen. So we're going to sing this song of the church that yes, God is real. Oh, there are some things I may not know.
yes, some folks may down. Some folks may scorn. All can desert and leave me alone. But as for me, oh. God is for he has washed and made me whole yeah his love for me it's just like your door said yes God is Let's do it one last time. Yeah, yes, God is real. Said he's real in my soul. And yes, God is real for he Put your hands together for Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, man. Yes, God is real. It's real in my, my soul. Amen. Thank you. Greetings to each and every one of you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. At this time, we would like to welcome all of our first-time visitors. If we have any first-time visitors or guests that's here with us, not a member of the second, if you don't mind, stand so we can acknowledge you and love on you. Amen. 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 Amen, brother. Amen. Amen. On behalf of our senior pastor, Dr. Maurice Watson, and the entire Second Baptist Family Church, we welcome you. Thank you so much, sir. Knowing you could have went anywhere else, but you chose to be here with the second. And we do thank you. Amen. For those of you on social media, thank you so much for chiming in with us this evening as we get ready to go higher and higher in the Lord's word. Amen. The gospel opera and stage play, There's a Stranger in Town, has been postponed until Friday, February the 3rd at 7 p.m. May. May, I'm going backwards, May the 3rd, 7 p.m., and Saturday, May the 4th at 6 p.m. For more information, please contact Dr. J. Terrell. Interested in meeting for the next gen who is taking a, uh, going to Walt Disney's ages 12 to 18 will take place after service April the 17th in the Family Life Center. For more information, please contact Pastor Ricky Calhoun. Amen. Y'all ready to hear from God and hear God's word? Let's give God a great big hand as we turn it back over to, amen, our teacher, Dr. Maurice Watson. This is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice and we're glad in it. How many of you are glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? What a blessing it is to assemble ourselves together to come together for yet another night of the study of God's Word. And I want to just thank God for each and every one of you coming out tonight uh, for Bible study. 
This has been an interesting week. We witnessed something we won't see for another 20 years. Uh, the eclipse, it was awe-inspiring. How many of you all got a chance to go outside and look up at it? The handiwork of God. Amen. It was great. It was great. Uh, somewhat underwhelming in some respects. I could have could have allowed everybody to come to work at that day. <laughs> and, and they let school out and all, everything else. But look to me, y'all jokers could have come to work. But we erred on the side of caution and uh, certainly didn't know what the traffic was going to be. And we, Our first uh, desire is always to keep everybody safe. Amen. But it really was an awe-inspiring event. Amen. One that I will never forget. I'm sure you won't forget it either. Trust that you've had a good week thus far. <clears throat> and here we are on what they call in business world hump day. Amen. About halfway through the week. Amen. Just two more days and then you'll be off. But while you're off, then I'm on. Amen. Uh, weekends is... Uh, is a work day. Tonight we want to continue our study of um, the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount uh, comprises Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, and it is by far the longest discourse of teaching that we have from Jesus as he teaches us uh, how uh, we are to live for his kingdom in this world, that we are to be a counterculture within the larger culture and that we are not to blend in with the world. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. And Jesus shows us what that kind of life looks like and how he expects us to live, how he expects us to treat each other, amen, and how he expects us to interact with one another. And so we come tonight to yet another one of the teachings of Jesus as we look tonight at Matthew chapter 5. We're going to finally finish the fifth chapter of Matthew. We started back at the beginning of the year. So we finally come to the final uh, lesson in chapter 5. And interestingly, it's about loving our enemies. Love, love your enemies. Verses 43 through 48. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. Let me read it into our hearing on tonight. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you um, and persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his Son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So we come yet again to one of these teachings, hard teachings of Jesus. Um, the, uh, the lesson here uh, is a continuation of what Jesus had already started Remember back in our last time we were together, it seemed like it was a lifetime ago, when we were together in Bible study in verses 38 to 42, we learned what we are not supposed to do when we are mistreated by others. What is that? We learned from that last lesson that we are not to retaliate. We are not to retaliate in kind for how people treat us. And uh, you remember we talked about that biblical principle in verses 38 to 42 of the eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Remember when we taught on that? Um, that was not a commandment. That was, uh, that was not given to individuals so much as it was to governmental authorities to mete out justice. Amen. That it is not up for us 
as individuals to meet out, meet out our own justice on people that we feel have done us wrong. That if we got back at everybody that did us wrong, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, then all of us would be blind and toothless. Amen. And so Jesus is saying that uh, in that teaching that that's not what we're supposed to do. So in these verses under consideration, he's building on that. And Jesus explains explicitly what we are supposed to do when people mistreat us. How should we react to people who mistreat us? So what we have here tonight is the sixth illustration. Remember, Jesus took six different illustrations where he draws a contrast between the false righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees with true righteousness. Write that in your notes. True righteousness. Remember what he said in Matthew 5 and 20. That is the key verse to the whole Sermon on the Mount. Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no way enter the kingdom of, of heaven. Amen. That we are to, our righteousness is to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Again, by way of review, you can only imagine how that must have sounded to uh, the average layperson of Jesus' day because the scribes and Pharisees were considered the most righteous and holy and God-fearing men in all of Jerusalem. And uh, uh, if the lay people, when they heard that, this must have been a shock to them. They'd never heard anything so radical as this. Wait, our righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the most righteous people in our eyes in the whole land, the scribes and Pharisees. And if the scribes and Pharisees' righteousness is obvious not, obviously not up to par or up to the standard that the Lord wants, then if they can't do it, then surely we can. That must have been how Jesus' first century audience must have heard him. Those were radical, radical words. And yet Jesus shows over and over again, over and over again in these illustrations that I've given you how he points out an Old Testament illustration or an Old Testament commandment and how the scribes and Pharisees had perverted that command and then Jesus comes along and gives his true interpretation of those commandments, the true meaning of those commandments. Why? Because the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees was only a more a kind of external righteousness. For example, as long they felt as long as we don't actually commit adultery with somebody, then we are okay. But they thought nothing about the lust that was in their hearts. So Jesus comes along and raises the bar to a whole new level. He says, no, uh, I say to you, whoever looks on a woman or a man to lust after him or her, you've already committed adultery. He took the issue of righteousness from external righteousness to a righteousness of the heart and a righteousness of the mind and a righteousness that, in, that involves your motives, a righteousness that involves your intentions. Amen. Because people that can't see an intention, but God can. People can't see lust in your heart, but God can. Are you with me? People can't see that you hate them and you want to murder them, but God can. So Jesus raises the standard. He raises the standard. And so what we have here is Jesus is giving yet another example of, of, of the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees over against the true righteousness that he came to establish. And he proposes something here that's nothing less than radical. The individual who can live up to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, what I just read, verse 43 to 48, if you can live up to this, then you have truly reached a spiritual milestone. Because Jesus saves the hardest one for last. The hardest one he saves for last. So first, let's look at the teaching of the Old Testament. Listen to what he says. He quotes from the Old Testament in verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, 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 you shall love your neighbor. The statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, is a command that is often repeated in both the New Testament 
and in the Old Testament. In each of these passages, these passages that I've uh, listed on your notes from the New Testament, Matthew 19, uh, verse 19, Matthew 22, verse 39, Mark 12, verse 31, Luke 10, verse 27, Romans 13, verse 9, Galatians 5, verse 14, and James 2, verse 8. Each of these passages, the Lord says, the, the writer says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I don't even have to read them. Those exact words are in each and every one of those New Testament passages. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But it wasn't just an Old Testament command. It was also a principle that was taught in the, uh, rather it wasn't just a New Testament command, it was also a principle that was taught in the Old Testament. I just want to look at two of these, if you will. Um, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Let's go over there. Put a marker in Matthew 5 because we're coming back. Let's go left, way left, over into the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18. Leviticus 19 verse 18 says, are y'all there? All right. Uh, if, if you're there, say amen. If you're not there, say wait up. And I was going to say use the table of content. That's what it's there for. He says, you shall not take revenge, you shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall what? Love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is an Old Testament principle that was not just taught in the New Testament. You shall, don't get revenge on people, but love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I'm going to say something about that. No, I guess I'm going to say it now. Lo no, I'm going to wait. I'm going to save that. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, the passage in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 1 through 4, shows us what that can look like. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Go right. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 1 through 4. This shows us, you don't see the exact words there, but it shows us what loving your neighbor as yourself can look like. Are y'all there? Deuteronomy 22, beginning at verse 1. You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray and hide yourself from them. You shall certainly bring them back to your, na to your brother. You see, his, his ox has, has run away, and you can get him, you get him, and you bring him back. All right? And if your brother is not near you, or if you do not know him, then you shall bring it to your own house, and it shall remain with you until your brother or sister seeks it. Then you shall restore it to him. You shall do the same with his donkey, and so shall you do with his garment, with anything, any, any lost thing of your brother's, which he has lost, and you have found, you shall do likewise. You must not hide yourself. You shall not see your brother's donkey or ox fall down among the, uh, along the road and hide yourself from them. You shall surely help him lift them up again. Let me bring it in modern language. So you see somebody walking down the street and their wallet falls out, June Bug. Their wallet falls out. And they keep on walking. This ain't no time for you to say, look, look at how the Lord done blessed me. <laughs> Y'all remember when Y2K came? Y2K, you had all these prosperity preachers saying, listen, y'all, you're going to wake up on January 1, 2000, and, and there are going to be millions of dollars in your bank account. You know, the, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. You remember they were talking all that nonsense? And I'm saying to myself, no. If, your, if the bank puts too much money in your account that's not yours, the Christian thing to do is not to say, look at how the Lord done bless me, but turn it back in. 
That ain't no blessing. <laughs> they eventually are going to find it. And your dummy self done spent it. Then you going to jail. Loving your neighbor as yourself means if you see somebody needs help, you help them. And if you see someone who has lost something, you don't keep it, you return it. That's what it means. That's just as one example of what it means. When you want people to do that for you, love your neighbor as you love your self. I mean, if you, would, if you lost your wallet, you, would, you want somebody to turn that wallet in? I don't understand how people can do that. I've seen people steal from the church. Stealing. Now, you know, God may have to get me for a lot of stuff. But I should, that's definitely ain't one of them. Stealing from the church. And then get up on Sunday shouting like you floating in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> that ain't love. That's greed. Amen. So, so this principle of loving your neighbor as yourself is both a New Testament and an Old Testament teaching. In the fullest sense, uh, let me see, where am I? Where am I? Um, an Israelite's neighbor was anyone, or not just an Israelite's neighbor, but our neighbors are anyone in need whom we might come across in our daily lives. Who's our neighbor? So let's look at Luke chapter 10. Turn to Luke chapter 10. Go to the New Testament. I love to hear those Bibles turning. Luke chapter 10. Let's give our Bibles some exercise. Turn them pages. Some of them are sticky because you ain't been turning them. <laughs> Luke chapter 10, verse 30 through 37. Okay. Okay. Um, somebody has just asked Jesus, you know, um, uh, uh, a question regarding what's the first commandment. Jesus said, you know, man, Jesus said, love the Lord your God, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And so one of these smart Alex in the crowd uh, stood up and, and said he wanted to justify himself. And he said to Jesus, Lord, who is my neighbor? Now, this, 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 this biblical scholar knew who his neighbor was. Um, but he was trying to seek and he trapped Jesus. Um, because he wasn't really asking, who is my neighbor? What he really wanted to know from Jesus is, who do I have the right not to love? Who do I have the right not to love, not to consider? Who is my non-neighbor? Because the Jewish people had this nationalism that we only love our own kind. So who do I have the right not to consider as my neighbor? So Jesus tells this parable. He says, um, Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among thieves, was stripped of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came, along, came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, uh, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went with him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him uh, to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, oh, that's a whole lot of money, and gave, uh, to them, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him, and whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. So Jesus said, so which one of these, which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So this smart addict wanted to ask Jesus, Lord, who is, who is my neighbor? Now, he knew theologically who his neighbor was. But what he was really asking is, who do I have the right not to consider as my neighbor? Who do I have the right, who do I have the right not to love? 
And Jesus is saying to him, you don't have the right not to love anybody. You're supposed to love everybody. So he said, let me tell you. Man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. It was, all, it was that, that riding road down from Jerusalem to Jericho it was full of thieves and bandits. People got robbed there all the time. And he fell among thieves. They robbed him and beat him up, left him half dead, bleeding on the side of the road. Here comes the priest. I'll call the priest the preacher. The preacher came along, saw the man laying down, bleeding out. He said, brother, I would help you, man, but, you know, I got to get to the church because I got to preach my sermon tonight. I got to teach Bible study tonight. Sorry, maybe next time. Then the Levite came. They were temple workers. I'll call them the deacons. So the deacon came. Deacon showed up. Deacon Sane showed up and said, man, look at you. <laughs> I sure would help you, but I'm on to do the devotion tonight, so I don't want to be late. And then Jesus throws a character in the parable who would be, if you were a first century Jewish person, you would be shocked because it is the most unlikely person that would stop, that, that a Jewish person would expect to stop and help a Samaritan. The Samaritan were mixed race, a mixed race of people. They were half Jewish, half Gentile. And the Jews hated the Samaritans, and the Samaritans hated the Jews. I mean, they considered themselves mortal enemies. Uh, his enemy came along. The priest done left him because he got to get to church to preach his sermon. The deacon left him bleeding out because he got to do devo devotion, but his enemy shows up. I mean, Jesus throws a monkey wrench into the whole, into the whole psyche. Shows up the man that they least would expect to stop and help a Jew. And help the man, bandaged up his wound, put him on his motorcycle. Drove him on into town, checked him into the Holiday Inn of Jerusalem. Dressed his wounds and then stayed with him all night. Left his American Express Platinum card at the front desk. And said, whatever it takes, just charge it on my account. I mean, who do you think was the neighbor? Sometimes your greatest neighbor is your enemy. And what Jesus is saying to this smart aleck, you want to know, who do I have the right not to love? Who do I have the right not to consider him as my neighbor? And any, any self-respecting Jew would know that would be a Samaritan, a mongrel, a mixed-blood person who wasn't whole, holy Jew or holy Gentile. Surely we can hate them. And yet Jesus shares this story to say, any person, who's your neighbor? Any person that you meet that has a need. It doesn't matter their race, their creed, their color, their religion. Any person that you meet is your neighbor. That's what we're seeing happening on the southern border of our country. When you see a former president who says of undocumented people, they are not people, they are animals. That makes me mad. To hear this man call people who are made in the Amalgo day, in the image and likeness of God, who says to them, of them, they are not people, they are animals. And then you've got the white ring, white Republican church all behind him. And come to church on Sunday saying, onward Christ Christian soldiers marching as to war. You a lie. You look at your neighbor as being an animal and get up and preach how you, oh, how you love Jesus. I'm sorry. I can't go with that brand of Christianity. And Jesus doesn't go with that brand of Christianity. This Americanized Christianity, where we made the flag equal, no, above the cross. No. So my, who, their attitude is, I have the right not to love immigrants. Why? Because they don't look like us. They don't believe like us. Or oh, I have the right not to love people who are of a different sexual orientation than me. It is this tribalism. And everybody is in their own tribes. And, and the tribalism says, if you're not in my tribe, then you are my enemy. If I sound like I'm preaching, I am because I'm passionate about that. 
because the church has been too quiet about it. Amen. We must not become tribal. We are Christians. We love everybody. Green, yellow, black, white, brown, it don't matter. We love everybody. And everybody is welcome at Second Baptist Church. And the day everybody is not welcome at Second Baptist Church is the day I won't be your pastor. Because we cease to be a church and then we become a country club. And country clubs say you can only be a member if you meet our criteria. We are not a country club. We are a church. With all of our faults and flaws and hang-ups and sins and failures, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Let me get off my... Y'all can tell I've been watching too much CNN. I've been, I got to stop watching it. <laughs> I, I got to stop watching CNN. So all I do is get mad. <laughs> all right, let's look at how the perversion of the teaching. All right, so let's go back to Matthew 5. Boy, I done got, on, I done got worked up. <laughs> Calm down, Watson. Calm down. <laughs> you got to learn how to laugh at yourself. But I sure was passionate. I mean it. From my toenails up, I mean it. <laughs> Amen. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Hmm. As in each of these five previous illustrations, you know what the Pharisees did? Jesus shows how the scribes and Pharisees perverted the meaning of the Old Testament teaching. They perverted it. Satan is always perverting the revelation of God. He, you know, he'll, he, he does so by giving you so much truth in order to make his deception believable. He twists the word of God. And the scribes and Pharisees kept part of the truth about uh, love, you shall love your neighbor, but they perverted the Old Testament teaching in two ways. Here is how they perverted the teaching. First, by omission. Omission. They omitted the phrase as yourself. Write that in your notes. Deuteronomy 19, remember 18 says, you shall love your neighbor how? As yourself. Let, let, me, let me say, what does that mean, love your neighbor? As you love yourself, which means you cannot love your neighbor until you first love yourself. Teach, Pastor Watson. You can't hate yourself and love people. You got to love you first. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. You see, these words were fully known by the scribes and Pharisees, but they were only partially taught. As with other scriptures, uh, they seem to be, uh, that's, that seemed to be too demanding for them. They, you, they, would, they would twist and omit certain aspects of the scripture so it can make it easier for them to obey them. Why? Because the scribes and Pharisees had that Jewish nationalism. That Jewish nationalism says we only love Jews. We only love our tribe. We only love people who look like us. We only love people who believe like us. We only love people who agree with us. It was this nationalism. So they took that out as you, as you love yourself. They, they omitted that. You see, they narrowed the meaning of neighbor to include only those people they, per, they preferred, preferred or approved of, which amounted to basically to their own kind. Write that in your notes. Those that they preferred, basically their own kind. Nothing is new under the sun. That's what we're seeing happening in America today. Jews shall not replace us walking with ticky lanterns, torches. Jews shall not replace us. There were very fine people on both sides. 
There were very fine people on both sides. Jews shall not replace us. And we are seeing an uptick in violence, anti-Semitism. And a lot of it goes back to the leader of the Republican Party. Y'all know who that is. Love only those who look like you, who believe like you, whose politics are the same as yours. Jews shall not replace us. And when this guy, this, 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 this white supremacist mows down this woman and takes her life, there were very fine people on both sides. The devil is a liar. This is, this is nothing new. That you, the Jewish people of Jesus, they had that same nationalism. We only love our own. We only love our own. Um, this is why they felt so justified in despising sinners and tax collectors. Remember in that parable, I won't read it, but Luke 18, 11, what you have, where there was a, a sinner, uh, a tax collector, and a Pharisee that went to temple, and they both prayed, and the Pharisee, in his Pharisee self-righteous prayer, says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. I'm a tither. I go to church. I'm not like that fellow over there, that tax collector. They were hated because a lot of tax collectors were dishonest. They were working for Rome, and they were skimming off the top. So I'm, I'm glad I'm not dishonest like that joker over there. And that tax collector wouldn't even lift his head, but just said, Lord, be merciful to me because I'm a sinner. And Jesus said he went down justified more than that self-righteous church member who felt it's okay for him to look down at his brother. Can I tell you something tonight? You can always find somebody who are less than holy, less holier than you. You can always find somebody that cusses more than you, that drinks more than you. You know, you know how we how we determine our spiritual maturity? We back ourselves up. Come here. Turn around. Just turn around. We back ourselves up to our brother and sister and say, look at how tall I am. And look at how short. Look at how short. <laughs> Look at how short old Wilkins is. But if you really want to know how tall you are, don't back up yourself up to your brother or your sister. Back yourself up against Jesus. And you'll see how morally taller he is than all of us. Are y'all with me here tonight? All right. All right, let me, let me get in here. They, 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 they narrowed it by omission, but they also narrowed it by addition. You see, the scribes and Pharisees perverted the Old Testament teaching. Jesus said, watch this, verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. They added this little phrase, and hate your enemy. Nowhere in the Bible do you find the command to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But see, they added that. Why they add it? Because they want to justify themselves in loving only the people that's like us. So that gives us the right then to call those uh, non-documented persons animals. I'm trying to make it live today. That gives us the right because they take the Bible. And he's selling Bibles. Lord have mercy. A man that don't read... Two Corinthians. <laughs> he sold steaks and they were no good. He sold a, a, a college education that never was there, a university. 
He done sold everything, and all of it was a hoax. But in the name of nationalism and Christian, uh, 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 American Christianity, where well, we've added the flag and made it higher than the cross. I got these Make America Great Again Bibles, $60. Make America great again, Bibles. Bible ain't thinking about America. How about make humanity in the image and likeness of God again? That's what the Word of God is. You know, that's why Jesus overturned the temple, because folk trying to pimp the church. Ain't nothing but a pimp. Pimp in the church selling Bibles to pay his legal bills. And we just, and people just that dumb. Yes, dumb. Because it sure ain't smart. Anyway, I told you I've been watching too much CNN. I got I to gotta stop watching. Pastor, you got to stop watching the news. You got to turn the news off because it's getting under your skin. Yes, it is. I'm just trying to make it live. <laughs> All right, let me go to the last point so I can get off this soapbox. Let's look at the perspective of Jesus. Write down your notes. Jesus goes on to state the kind of love which ought to characterize his people. And it's a sevenfold characteristic. So he says, verse 44, But I say to you, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Here is one of the most powerful teachings in the Scripture. Here's one of the most powerful teachings when you talk about what does love mean. Real love is when you can love your enemy. When you can love somebody that you know don't like you and that you don't particularly care for either from sometimes, but you still got to love them. This must have been radical for the disciples. It went against everything the scribes and Pharisees had taught because the scribes and Pharisees, they had perverted and twisted the law to mean you can love your fellow Jewish believers, but you can hate any, everybody else. Jews shall not replace us. It's okay to call people at the border animals, as long as you love folk who believe like you and who look like you. Are y'all with me? But Jesus said, love your enemies. That word love in verse 44 is the Greek word agape, agape, A-G-A-P-E, agape. It is the highest form of love. It is unconditional love. Unconditional love. It's love that seeks the well-being of others over and above your own well-being. Amen. Romans chapter 12, verse 20. Romans chapter 12, verse 20. Let's look at it real quick. Hold your finger. Hold your finger there in Matthew 5. because We're coming right back to it. Romans 12, 20. Somebody read that so I don't have to fumble around trying to find it. What does it say? Hold on. Hold on, Miss Watson. It says, therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. If your enemy is hungry, don't pass by on the other side and say, well, man, I, I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> no. You give him something to eat. If he's thirsty, you give him something to drink. In doing so, it's like you're putting hot coals of fire of conviction on that person's head. All right. The second thing Jesus said about loving your enemies, uh, love, love, the love he came for us to have is, he says, bless your cursors. Verse 44, Matthew 5, 44. But I say, if you love your enemies, bless those who curse you. Blessed, that word blessed is the word for, uh, from which we get our English word eulogy, eulogy. You, we got some funeral home people here. We all been to funerals. A eulogy means to speak well of, to speak, to heap praises on, to speak well. Speaking, eulogizing people who curse you, our natural selves, we want to put our hand on our hips and let that neck go and say, you curse me, I got to cuss you back. 
But love says, eulogize them. Wow. That's radical, ain't it? Speaking well of people who are cursing you, who are wishing ill for you. But he says, don't be overcome with evil. That's the next verse in Romans. But overcome evil with good. All right? Eulogize them. So next time, just, just find something nice to say about them, no matter what they say about you. You find something nice to say about them. And, and let them look foolish. Here they are trying to put you down, and yet you are keeping your cool, and you are speaking words of commendation as opposed to getting on their level. What did uh, Michelle say? When they go low, you go high. But some of us, we want to fall down on the floor and get as low as we can with them. <laughs> then he says, the love I'm talking about means you got to help your haters. Do good to those who do evil to you. Do good to people who are doing evil to you. I mean, again, that's radical. That's radical. But Jesus said, in so doing. Paul said, you heap coals of fire of conviction. When you know they have been trying to undercut you in every way, and yet instead of you getting on their level, when you find opportunities to help them, you help them. And man, they'll look like they are that small. They'll be so small that they can sit on a dime and their feet won't even touch the floor. <laughs> Teach pastor what? <laughs> then he says, pray for your persecutors. Pray for those, he says, um, or who uh, persecute you and, say, and, and those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Pray for them. The best way to have the right attitude toward those who persecute you is to bring them before the Lord in prayer. Ask God, pray for them. Pray for them. Ask God to forgive your persecutors. Pray for their peace. Pray um, that, th that you'll have peace, that there'll be peace between you and that person. Pray for that person's salvation. Lift them to God. Obviously, they are spewing on you some pain that comes from other places in their lives that you had nothing to do with. But you know, hurt people hurt people. So pray for them. Pray for them. It's hard to hate somebody and pray for them at the same time. It's almost impossible. So when you feel that bitterness about to bubble up in your heart, pray for them. Pray for them. You got to pull that bitterness up. You know why? The Bible says that, that we, uh, sometimes there's a root of bitterness, a root. You know what a root is? It grows beneath the surface. And it's like a weed. You can get your weed eater out. And you can cut it down to, the, to its level to the dirt. But if that root is there, it's going to come back up. So you got to ask God, Lord, pull this weed out of my heart. Pull this weed, of the whole root system out of my heart. The whole root system so it can't come back up. So that when they do me wrong, I'm going to pray for them. Jesus set an example of that on the cross. Luke chapter... Um, 23, verse 34, on the cross, they are publicly executing Jesus. I don't think you can do more, anything more harmful to a person than to execute them. I mean, you say, but they lied on me. They, well, lying on you is one thing, but hanging you, nailing you to a cross goes way beyond somebody telling a lie on you, right? And what did Jesus do? He prayed for them. And says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Stephen in Acts 7, that's the next scripture, was another example. As they were stoning him to death, he looks up and says, Lord, don't hold this against them. When you pray for your persecutors, it's hard for you to pray for somebody and hate them at the same time. It helps you. It frees you. It, you don't just do it for them. Do it for yourself. Are you with me today? And then, next of all, 
uh, manifest your sonship. Look at verse 45. That you may do all of this, he says, that you may be sons of your father in heaven. Because he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. Now, don't construe the meaning of Jesus' words here to mean that you can do good things in order to save yourself. When he says that you may be sons of God, it doesn't suggest that you may become a son of God because you love your neighbor or because you prayed for them. No, no. When you do so, you are manifesting that you are a son, that you are a daughter of God because you are able to pray for people who persecute you. You are able to love your enemies. You are able to do good. It's a sign that you are saved. Are y'all with me? I'm almost done. Next of all, you got to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. So he says, verse 46, if you love those who love you, he says, that's pretty easy. What reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Now, the tax collectors were considered the most sinful, dishonest people in the world. He said even the, even the most sinful, dishonest people in the community love those who love them. And if you greet your brother only, what do you do more than others? Not, they're not even the tax collectors, the most sinful people you consider in the community. They even speak to those who they consider are their brothers or their sisters. So he said, listen, if you only love those who love you, you're no better than the scribes and Pharisees. You're no better than the tax collectors. Anybody can do that. But Jesus says, I'm raising the bar. And when you learn through my strength to love your, your enemies, you are then exemplifying a righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Lastly, Jesus said, here's what love looks like, that you got to be like your heavenly Father. Verse 48, therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, that word perfect there means complete or mature. Write that in your notes. It's not talking about sinless perfection because none of us are going to achieve in this world sinless perfection. But Jesus is saying that we, that to, that we are to be perfect in the way we treat each other as God would have us to treat each other by loving those who are the most difficult people in the world to love, loving your enemies. The Lord will never lower his standard to accommodate our sinfulness. He doesn't say, okay, I'll give you a break this time. You can hate that joker who lied on you the other day for 15 minutes. No, you don't even have the right to hate him for 15 minutes. The Lord says, I want you to love your enemies. If you receive this word tonight, give the Lord praise. All right, that's a hard teaching, but boy, it sure is one we need. It's one that America needs. Now tonight, if you are here tonight and you have sat through this kind of teaching and you say, Pastor, man, I appreciate that teaching tonight, and I've been looking for a church and looking for a pastor that would teach me the Word of God so I can grow in my walk with God. And even tonight, on this Wednesday night, if you want to join this church, you come give me your hand, uh, but give God your heart, and we'll be happy to take you. And you can see me after service tonight and say, Pastor, man, I, I believe God wants me to be a part of Second Baptist Church, and you'll be my spiritual leader. I'd be happy to do so. We'd be happy to have you. Now, come on, deacons. Let's give the Lord our tithe and offerings tonight. Amen. Let's give the night real quickly. Get it out your pocket. Get it out. Get it out before you spend it on something. Spend God's money on something else. De Dillard's going to have a sale. They're going to have an eclipse sale. <laughs> yeah. All that stuff they bought. Then nobody goes to the store. So you're going to be able to get it on sale. You're going to be saying, look how the Lord done blessed me. <laughs> Amen. The deacons are coming. What we got? Come on, come on, shorty. Amen. <clears throat> uh, if you don't mind, can I have your attention, please? Uh, it is my sad duty to 
uh, say to some of you all who are not aware, some of you may already know about the transitioning of our beloved Deacon Calvin Richardson. Yes, and uh, so uh, you'll hear more information coming from me later on. And let's keep Sister Frances Richardson in your prayers and continue to pray even for our church family because he was a very close love to each and every one of us. So I just want to put that out there to let you know that. God bless you. Amen. We, we certainly want to keep uh, the Richardson family uh, lifted in prayer. I had an opportunity to speak to Mrs. Richardson this afternoon, and we certainly want to keep them lifted up in our prayers tonight. Matter of fact, why don't we dismiss with a word of prayer. Let's just stand together. Lord, how we love and bless you and thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for challenging us to live by a higher standard. Teach us how to love each other and to love even people that's difficult to love. Teach us how to love that most important person in our life and that is our enemy. Teach us to love like Jesus loved. Oh God, now I pray for the Richardson family. Pray for Mrs. Richardson, Mrs. Richardson and her family in the loss of their loved one. I pray your strength, your comfort, your presence will be with them. Oh God, will you minister your strength, minister your grace to them on this, on this evening. And God, I know that there's an empty place at their table tonight. And yet we take refuge in knowing that you specialize in filling the empty and void places of our hearts and of our families with your presence. Will you do that tonight? Fill that emptiness with your presence, with your love, with your strength, and with your comfort. Now dismiss us now from this place, but never from your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.